Hello everyone and welcome to this, the last in the series of webinars MDC Connects. So for those of you that have been with us all the way through, I'm Sarah Brockbank, I'm the lead scientist at Medicines Discovery Passport and I'm hosting the session today with Darren Holmes. So this year MDC Connects is focused on complex medicines and we've been joined by a whole host of experts from across the UK and they have taken us from concept through to the clinic. So here we are today and we're ready for the clinic. So in this session, we're going to describe how to prepare for the clinic, to formulate, to scale up and to navigate the regulatory process. And I'd like to welcome three speakers. So firstly, Claire Patterson, a senior principal scientist at Cedar Pharmaceutical Development Services, and Claire will describe the advantages of good formulation. And then we're joined by Emily Port and Graham Worrell from CPI, and they're going to describe the innovative and specialised techniques that are required in the scale up and manufacture of complex medicines. And finally, we've got Alan Boyd, who's founder of Boyd's Consultants, and Alan's going to describe what the regulators want from a medicine and how the challenges for a complex med may may not differ from conventional medicines. And so we're going to take questions at the end of each presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please put this in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screens. If you have a question um, that you think of while the speaker is talking, please put the question in straight away so that they're ready um, when the speaker has finished talking. So without further ado, over to you, Claire. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, can you see my slides okay, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. So today's talk is addressing some of the specific challenges associated with formulation development for complex medicines. This is based on some of my experiences working as a consultant at um, Seda Pharmaceutical Development Services and, and previously uh, in Big Pharma. So, as I'm sure you're aware, um, few complex medicines are actually suitable for oral absorption. They simply wouldn't survive the conditions in the GI tract, and often the biopharmaceutical properties aren't amenable um, for oral absorption. So the majority of the complex medicine formulations that we work on then are parenterals. So they're injected either intravenously, intramuscular, subcutaneous, or directly into the tumour. Formulation can play varying roles in complex medicines. It can either be um, a fairly straightforward vehicle in which the active conjugate is dispersed, or it can be a much more complex carrier system, for example, a liposomal formulation or a polymeric nanoparticle, for example, where that formulation is really fundamental to delivering the active ingredient to its site of action. So let's consider uh, vehicles for drug conjugates first off then. So if we think of things like anti antibody drug conjugates, polymer conjugates, or the branch systems like dendromers. So they need to be formulated as a, a liquid, as a solution for administration. So since they're parenteral, these products must be sterile. Um, and we often present them as unpreserved frozen solutions or concentrates for dilution or they could be lyophiles, that's uh, freeze-dried powders essentially that need to be reconstituted. And that's either with a commercially available diluent such as saline or dextrose, or a custom diluent that's been designed and, and um, supplied for particular use with that product. Um, the components usually consist of a, a buffer system and the pH would be selected to maximize the stability from both a physical and a chemical perspective of the formulation. Uh, and it must be within a physiologically uh, tolerable range as well, depending on um, the exact site of administration. We often have tonicity modifiers in there um, to make sure that the osmolarity is, is within range. There might be cryoprotectants, um, solvents and solubilizers to make sure that your active uh, is kept in solution and doesn't precipitate either in the formulation or immediately after administration. And there might be a requirement for other stabilizers to be added as well to preserve um, the, uh, again, the chemical and the physical stability of the product. On the right hand side, you can see a typical kind of specification. Um, this is the kind of uh, the data and the information that we need to generate and collect and submit to the regulatory authority in, in, in for example, an IMPD. 
these are the kind of clauses for a generic parental product, but there are some additional character, uh, characterization tests that we need to perform additional considerations for complex medicines. And it's, it's really important, and this is the key message of my talk really, it's really important that you think early on in development about developing these methods and characterizing these attributes of these formulations that can be absolutely critical to the, the performance from a safety and an efficacy perspective. And these include things like particle size and distribution of, for example, a nanomedicine product, um, studies to understand any aggregation potential or changes in structural conformation, which may then impact the functionality of your complex medicine and understand if any of those changes that might happen on storage are reversible or irreversible, for example. And then a really important one that quite often gets overlooked actually, and I've seen regulators really push back and make sure that this is fully and well characterized and understood um, is, is about API release. Oops. Um, sorry, about API release. That's if you've got a conjugated active ingredient to a, um, a scaffold or a construct, it's understanding throughout the life of the product when that uh, API is uh, still attached versus when it comes off. It has to come off eventually to be um, active. Um, but it's understanding throughout the life of the product when that happens. So your analytical method must discriminate between, must differentiate between that that's conjugated and that which has been released. Uh, and it depends highly on the nature of your product as to which method you should use, which method would be suitable. And they're not compendial methods and it's not trivial to develop either. They, this really does require effort. It could be simple methods like HPLC, if you can differentiate on the basis of hydrophobicity, for example, or you might need a physical separation technique like dialysis or size exclusion chromatography, or, or there's many, many other alternatives as well, much more complex as well. So just to say, it might look like a simple solution, but, but it's really not, and the devil's in the detail with these things. So just focusing a little bit more on this API release um, concept then. So let's let's think of an example, say, of a drug polymer conjugate. So you've got your API, these green blobs here, attached to your polymer scaffold via a linker, um, which would degrade in contact with water. Um, and it might also be pH sensitive. So when we design a formulation, a vehicle, a buffer for this, we need to make sure that it's appropriate pH um, to make sure that the API isn't released um, prematurely. Um, the right ionic strength and counter ions, et cetera, to maximize the chemical and the physical stability. And, and this is really what I'm talking about. We need to try and um, understand this, the release of that API right from drug substance manufacture to drug product manufacture. So when the um, conjugate is sort of mixed with the, the liquid formulation, for example, or lyophilized, then through that reconstitution process in the pharmacy, then however long it sits there before it's, you know, while it's delivered up to the ward. And then you might have a 90 minute IV infusion, for example. So over this whole duration, you need to know um, how much of the drug is still attached to the conjugate um, versus how much has come off. Um, and it doesn't stop there. You need to understand the same thing in vivo as well, once it's in the body so that you can understand the performance of your product. And this is actually an added level of complexity, because if you think that your nanomedicine conjugate is often of a similar size, for example, to the plasma proteins, um, and it's a lot more of a complex matrix to try and separate the, 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 the free and the conjugated drug from. But thankfully, there are institutions like the Nanomedicine Characterization Laboratory that are trying to develop more standardized procedures for things like this. Um, and I've put um, a link here to a method that you can have a look at in your own time. This is a stable isotope ultrafiltration assay um, that they recommend for um, understanding release in plasma. Uh, and if, if you don't understand, you know, this, this, this aspect can drastically affect the safety and the efficacy of your of your product if all the drug has dropped off before you've administered it for example you know that whole development of that fancy construct was almost completely pointless it's just not going to get to its site of action and it's 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 not going to be effective or equally it could have safety implications if you've got high free drug levels immediately after administration you know if you've got a particularly toxic uh, api then that could have uh, safety implications as well so yeah really important aspect to understand api release um, I haven't got time to go through this today, but I wanted to just direct you to this publication that I, uh, I was um, a lead author on together with the AZ team, um, where we combined 
um, these in vitro release studies and plasma release studies together with carefully designed pharmacokinetic studies and mathematical modeling to optimize the release rate of a drug, the design of that linker to optimize the release rate of the drug to get the best balance between um, safety and efficacy of a product. So if you have time, I, you know, it'd be great if you could have a, have a look at this article. Um, let's touch briefly on aggregation, um, another property that we need to control um, and be aware of and measure. So let's take an example of an antibody drug conjugate in solution. Um, the risk with these things is that they may undergo irreversible aggregation in the formulation, and that may cause a loss of biological activity. It might not work anymore. Um, and also it will make the product uh, more immunogenic as well. You could have uh, more severe immunogenicity responses to it. So we have to think about that carefully in formulation design and make sure it's an appropriate pH um, to minimize aggregation and that any additives are present to help prevent that aggregation, such as arginine, for example. But you don't know if it's aggregating if you haven't got a method to detect it. So again, the emphasis there is really to develop these methods early on to understand is your product what you think it is. So coming on to some of the more complex drug delivery systems then, um, these are things like micelles, liposomes, polymeric nanoparticles, LMPs. So these are things where the drug is essentially encapsulated um, within a particle, um, and that's to provide either protection from the biological, bi biological environment or to help it to cross biological barriers for it to get into a cell, for example, if it's an intracellular target. But then it must also release the API at the target site of action. It might also include additional targeting ligands or other surface functionalization as well. Um, I want to draw a comparison here to conventional formulations. So if you have a, an orally administered tablet, for example, really the only thing that formulation can influence in that drug's performance is its absorption rate. Once it's in the systemic circulation, it, it's going to do its own thing. However, for these types of formulations, um, the attributes of the formulation itself, and I'll come on to what those might be in a moment, but they can affect almost every stage of that admin process. So the absorption, distribution, and then how quickly it's metabolized and eliminated from the body as well. So the holy grail really is to try and understand what those critical factors are that affect biological performance of your formulation. Um, it's not a trivial thing to do, and it's recognized by the regulators that it, it is very challenging to do. Um, but really, there is a push for early development of these assays and the right tests to try and understand the link between some of these attributes and its, in, uh, its biological performance. So there's a few of them listed here, but let's take um, surface charge, for example. So if you make a batch of um, liposomes that have a different surface charge, for example, maybe due to the, the uh, lipid that's been used, a different batch of lipid, for example, that could lead to a difference in aggregation in your formulation vial. When that's then administered, um, the difference in the size of the particles could affect how it distributes throughout the body. It might mean that um, you know, very small particles can get filtered out through the kidney, larger ones can't. Um, very large particles can't extravasate into the tumor, smaller ones can. You could start to see differences in how it distributes throughout the body. And also the way that the um, plasma proteins interact with the surface of the liposome um, could also change based on um, uh, surface charge, and that might affect its um, recognition by organs of the reticular endothelial system and how quickly it's cleared from the body. But those differences aren't necessarily always visible from the systemic pharmacokinetics. Um, the subtleties about some of these nanomedicines are, it's, it's actually the concentration at the site of action in the tumor, for example, that's critical to the, the performance, and that's not always reflected by systemic plasma concentrations. So I haven't got time to go through all that today, but I'd really recommend that you take a look at this uh, paper by the team from BIND, um, who, and this is held up as, you know, a really sort of a gold standard paper where they've used quality by design approach to try and develop a polymeric nanoparticle. Um, and they've tried to understand what the critical attributes of, of their, their formulation are, the material inputs, um, the, the, the manufacturing process parameters, et cetera, and try and make different variants, test them in vivo and understand what impact those had to, to really generate a really strong understanding of what needs to be controlled throughout development to make sure that you get you know, robust data generated. 
So just very briefly, this is the NCL, the Nanotechnology Characterization Laboratory that I mentioned. They've published a um, very useful series of articles, actually, and one is on the common pitfalls that they've seen through their experience of evaluating uh, different um, sponsors' technologies. And they cite some quite interesting examples where two batches, for example, of pegylated gold nanoparticles were showing very different safety responses. They, they couldn't differentiate um, between them in terms of some of the physical attributes like um, DLS, you know, size and surface charge and things like that. Um, but they did notice from a protein binding assay that, that the surface interaction was very different and they, they eventually attributed it to the fact that the peg was dropping off with time with one of the batches compared to the other. So that's the, the importance really of having a raft of tests to try and characterize these things to, to really understand what's going on. So in conclusion then, um, just the, the key message from my talk is really to emphasize the importance of understanding the attributes of your formulation that might be important in its um, um, biological performance. And to do this much earlier on in development than you would for a conventional formulation. It might not all have to go into that first phase one submission, but it's really important that you're building that understanding so that when you make one batch, you know, and then a few months later make another batch, are they going to behave in, in the same way? Uh, and particular methods to concentrate on, from my perspective, are particle size and aggregation potential, um, understanding confirmation in solution, and does it maintain its functionality? And then this API release really is a critical one. And then to finish, here's a, a slightly dodgy analogy to, to a, a dunked biscuit. So there's no point in designing a biscuit with a fabulous crunch if you're going to leave it dunked in your tea for too long and it's all fallen apart. So um, even if, if the analogy doesn't work properly, at least you remember the presentation, I guess. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Over to Sarah for any questions. Thanks, Claire. Excellent. Um, and, and well done. Claire's actually got her seven year old with her today. Um, so congratulations to him. <laughs> Staying downstairs, yes. <laughs> yes. So um, one question I've got here is formulation of complex meds is complex business, obviously. Um, what are the risks of complete failure to achieve a suitable formulation? Does it happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, I think. The translation from bench to clinic just hasn't been as good as it should have been for nanomedicines. I think that's been well acknowledged. And this um, the formulation development and understanding of the attributes, that, that is one of the, the factors that is cited as a potential area where there's not enough understanding for when you scale up, have you changed the, the, the properties? And therefore, is it not working as well as it did in the, in the preclinical species, for example? So... Um, I th no, I think if you can develop, if you can work to develop the the test, so if you you just need to be aware of the characteristics that are important for performance, like the aggregation, the size, and the release. There are methods out there. It's it's not easy, but there are methods out there um, to just if you put the effort into understanding those and controlling those, then you're in a much better position. Yes, of course, there's there's failures. Hopefully, there's there's a solution. <laughs> But how much can be optimised and how much is baked into the different technologies and different delivery technologies? Yeah, um, so I think it depends. Complex medicines, they're, they're a completely diverse set of, of entities, aren't they, really? So if you've got ADCs, for example, you might have to go back to um, sort of modifying the, the structure, the peptides that are included to 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 make them less likely to aggregate, for example. So yeah, I think it just, it might just depend how far you have to push back. Can it be rectified with a simple solution or do you have to go back to design of the actual chemical structure um, to help to, to, to optimize the, the properties there? And it's always gonna be a balance, isn't it? Between having the right stability in an in vitro situation um, compared to the performance that you need to achieve, the functionality that you need to achieve in vivo. And are the differences between formulations required for your preclinical in vivo work and formulations required for the clinic? Um, so of, sometimes you have to go to much higher doses. So that can be a challenge that you need to achieve much higher concentrations in solution than you would in the clinic. Um, with conventional medicines, we can often get away with using different um, 
excipient solubilizers and things that are acceptable preclinically, but they wouldn't be acceptable in the clinic. That's a bit more challenging here, again, because I've said it's not just about getting the drug on board. Your delivery system has to be intact and, and it can affect the performance of those. So, yeah, it is it is more difficult. You, there's some uh, benefits that you don't have to have quite as long a shelf life, maybe, because you can you know manufacture and, and dose almost immediately. Um, but again, yeah, the importance is on understanding whatever process you come up with and contr the controls that you have in place for that process, um, understanding if, if, if you're meeting the criteria and you know knowing what you've got at the point of administration. It's not just when you made it, it's the point that you administer it and, and knowing how much it's changed from one point to the next. Oh, thank you very much. So Emily, if, if you could... Yep. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Brilliant. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so myself and my colleague Graham Worrell from Complex Medicines team in formulation at CPI is going to take you through overcoming the challenges of scaling up complex medicine. So Graham is just going to give you a quick introduction to who and what CPI uh, and do. Graham? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. So um, I don't know if uh, you've heard about who CPI are, but um, at CPI, we help companies to develop, prove, scale up, and commercialize new products and processes. Um, and we are part of the high value manufacturing catapult. So the investment comes from government, flows through Innovate UK into the catapult network um, and CPI are part of the high value manufacturing catapult. We are a, a, um, a business that um, concentrates on the process industry. And so process covers virtually uh, every market sector. And um, we are talking to you today as part of the formulation business unit for CPI. And we here have our, uh, our, that's where we have our nano, uh, nano pharmaceuticals um, effort. Um, how can you work with us? Um, you can work with us on a CR&D CR basis or on a commercial basis. And uh, where do we fit into the whole development process? We don't actually invent anything at CPI. We take that next stage of turning great inventions, whether they be from large companies or from SMEs, um, into um, or taking them along that trail into commercialization. So we work in that center, that center area of developing processes. Okay, Emily, next slide. Thanks, Graham. So today we're going to talk to you about uh, nile medicines and why it's so difficult to scale up uh, the formulation and manufacturing. So when you do a nano medicine formulation process, uh, you've got your in process controls and it can be incredibly difficult to get consistent critically critical quality attributes. So exactly the same ones that Claire was talking about in the previous um, presentation. And the reason it's so critical to get these uh, consistent is so that we've got a consistent biological performance. Um, so with scale up, it can be very difficult for when you're taking something, for example, for a one mil scale up to one litre scale, 10 litre scale to get exactly the same process, uh, to get exactly the same critical quality attributes um, out of the process. And therefore, if you were to scale something up from bench scale to clinic scale, are you going to get the same product um, that's put into the body? So in terms of making complex medicine, you've got generally two stages. You've got the system self-assembly. So this is a combination of two, two streams to form nanoparticles using a mixing device. This could be a specific mixing, a mixing device or it could be quite a conventional one, for example, a T-piece mixer, a syringe mixer, etc. cetera. Um, and you can use the inline dilution as well to improve the stability of the particles. So sometimes you have got a stability challenge as soon as you've combined two streams. So you can have dilution so that you can reduce the concentration. And then you've got a little bit more time before you get to downstream processing um, to be able to characterize your particles initially. When you're talking about scalar considerations, so obviously the, vo uh, the volume is the biggest parameter that's going to change. So you could, you know, you could go from one or two mil, uh, 20 mil at the small scale up to a large scale, you're typically looking at about 10 litres. Additionally, you'd be looking at the flow rate um, increasing. So from about 12 mil a minute to 150 mil a minute, for example, 
so that you can uh, make sure that you, you, you're not going to have a, a process going to run for hours and hours and hours at the small scale. So you want to have it both scalable in terms of volume and flow rate. In terms of the flow rate ratio and the inputs between the two different phases, you'd typically be looking to keep these constant, but this is completely system dependent, so it could need some tweaking as you scale up, depending on what system, for example, lipid nanoparticles, polymeric nanoparticles, are they all going to behave the same with, with the same actives? So typically, you'd be looking at step one as running a small scale development work to make sure you understand the system. If you change a parameter, what effect does this, does this have on the critical quality attributes? You would then transfer to scale up, and then you would have to implement any development you would need at scale to be able to fine tune the parameters. Throughout the whole scale up process, you would define the success by making sure you've got consistent characterization results. So including the particle size, the PGI, so that's the particle uh, distribution index. So sorry, polydispersity index, which is what um, Claire was talking about as well in the previous discussion, the zeta potential, so the surface charge, and also the loading and the API release. The next stage is the downstream processing. So this would allow you to clean up your products so you've made it, but it's not necessarily fit for purpose yet. So it'd allow you to remove any impurity, so any unreacted uh, active, or if you've got any unwanted solvent. So sometimes you need to, for example, um, use ethanol as one of the mixing streams and you wouldn't be wanting ethanol in your final drug product. So this would allow you to remove that ethanol. Additionally, you can also exchange the buffer for the final solvent system. So if you've got to make it in a specific pH, but then your uh, final drug product you'll be wanting at a different pH, for example, physiological pH, this will allow you to do that. And also you would be allowed to reduce the volume to be able to get a specific concentration. So for example, if you had uh, stability of the product at a certain concentration of active or particle, um, or it's what you would need for the clinic, then you'll be able to con concentrate to final volume. Typically for this, you'd be looking at a similar sort of change in volume. So for example, 20 ml up to 10 litre scale. The flow rates, again, quite similar to what you were seeing before. So 50 ml, but up to uh, an increased one litre per minute uh, is possible as well. You'd also be looking to scale the filter surface area because if you stuck with a small surface area filter, it would mean that the efficiency of the process would be very low and you might get filter blockages but you'll be looking at a consistent pore size of the filter because that would change the product you'd be getting out of it. It's critical though with downstream processing that you understand the effects of, for example, shear rate to ensure no damage to the product. So once you've made the product, it can sometimes be quite susceptible to high shear rates depending on what you've got. So you need to make sure that you're not actually damaging the product as you scale up. Also linked to that is the pressure in the system, making sure that you have a con uh, consistent pressure so you're not having any effect in the product. But additionally, that flux rate, so linked to the flow rate and the pressure in the system. If you've got uh, a high flow rate but a low pressure, you could have a low flux rate, and that means that you could have a downstream processing time of, of hours, which is not an efficient process. So these are all the different parameters you need to consider. Again, throughout the scale up, you'd be using the similar uh, consistent characterization results, including the size, etc., to be able to define the success of your scale up. When working at CPI, uh, we also have additional scale up considerations that you'd be wanting to look at. So, pre experiment, we'll be looking at the safety assessments. So, if you were to use potent active pharmaceutical ingredients, you'd need to consider how you would change working with them because of the increased scale. If you were using high volumes of flammable solvents, you'd need to consider the ATEX requirements as well. And this would all be applicable to what you'll be doing in the, in the clinical stage as well. So this all helps you get to that end point. During the experiment, it'll be how to handle large volumes of liquid. So when you've got one millisample, you wouldn't need to consider necessarily how you'd be doing additional mixing. But when you've got litres and litres of, of, of sample, if you're doing a lot of downstream processing in batch form, you need to consider how you've got a vessel uh, static on, 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 a, on, a, on a balance, for example, for a couple of hours, would you need additional mixing in that to make sure that you're actually getting uh, downstream processing um, of the entire batch rather than just part of it? After the experiment, we've got to make sure we've got efficient clean down to avoid any cross contamination between batches and how we consider the waste disposal of large uh, product volumes as well. And then sometimes, um, you need to do some post-experiment environmental monitoring as well, for example, because you've worked with potent active pharmaceutical ingredients um, to make sure that you've actually contained and cleaned down to the correct level. So 
that's typically what we would do at CPI for scale up. So now we can take you through two uh, case studies of, of what we've worked on before. So these are both related to advancing complex medicines production. So this is a project that we worked um, in partnership with both Strathclyde and Manchester universities. We also worked with equipment manufacturers um, such as Precision Nanosystem and Melbourne Panalytical who were able to uh, provide support for as we set up the equipment during this project and also AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Croda who helped uh, provide some support as well. So this was all to do with accelerating the development of complex medicines. So the idea was we would be creating a continuous pilot line um, where CPI would be able to act as a nanomedicines hub so that either small uh, SMEs could come to CPI and say, right, we've got this small scale process and we want to scale it up uh, to a continuous process ready for the clinic. Um, so we wouldn't obviously take it to the GMP stage, but we'll be scaling it up so that it could uh, be almost there. Um, so this was a collaborative R&D project. Um, it was over two years and it was uh, about 765K. Um, and what it looked like was having a pilot line like so. So you'd incorporate an organic phase and aqueous phase into the precision nanosystems blaze system. This is a microfluidic chip that will be able to create nanoparticles. We would then have a custom built TFF system, which allowed for continuous TFF of the, of the product. So we'll be able to get ethanol removal, removing impurities and do a buffer exchange. And then we would have Malvin Panalytical Zetasizer at, at line particle sizing. And the idea is this would give you a reproducible product. And we would use this system, this nanomedicines hub, to be able to help SMEs be able to scale up their system. Then there is another project, and I think Graham is just going to touch on what this one was. Yes, thanks, Emily. Yes, and just to build on what Emily said, um, all, all of the, the things that Emily's touched on there when it comes to scaling up the processes um, are equally valid for this uh, approach that we took here as, as they were for hers. Um, in this project, this is again um, a, um, a CR&D activity. This is a Horizon 2020 project um, and uh, involved eight collaborators across Europe. Um, it was a four-year project, and here the value was um, into, the, into the millions. Um, it was a large piece of work, and it basically involved converting a small batch process into a continuous process and uh, using micromixing as the approach. The micromixing itself lends, its, lends itself towards making nanoparticles because of that controlled mixing um, environment, um, as opposed to the, the constantly varying conditions that you see within a batch process. Um, in this case, the, the idea was to make some gold nanoparticles that would then be um, functionalized or the surface would be functionalized to um, carry the cargo. Um, and the production of the gold nanoparticles was carried out within a continuous uh, mixing reactor. As uh, uh, Emily, if you move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so there's a, an image here that you can see on this slide of, of the um, actual pilot line here. Um, we moved from taking a, as I say, a small um, batch process of about 100 mil in, in a beaker through to a scale that would run at um, 200 or up to 200 mils a minute. What you can see here in the image is on the left hand side, um, we have uh, in one of the cabinets, the uh, precursors in the pumps, they were then fed through to the central mixing uh, or the central box, which contains the mixing elements. And in this case, it was a corning mic uh, micromixer arrangement. And then they left that box and went through to the uh, cleanup and isolation stage, which again, it was uh, using our in-house built continuous um, um, TFF system. At any, one, at any stage, we could remove the product from here. So after micromixing, we could also take it away and do batch processing if we needed to do some subsequent um, uh, surface treatment to the to the uh, particles, and we could carry out batch TFF as well. So it's a very flexible system. It's a, a legacy item now. We have that at CPI, and it's obviously available for, for use um, um, in, in collaboration with, with CPI for, for different projects. So next slide, please, uh, Emily. So I think this just to just to summarize, really. Um, ho hopefully, Emily has, uh, has explained to you some of the um, issues involved with scaling up. It's not quite a straightforward process, even when you're using a whole series of mixing chips from, from one supplier. Um, as you go up in um, flow rate, as you go up in concentration, 
And as you go to different scales, um, things can change and the process can need tweaking. Um, all of this, it should be pointed out, and I think Claire point, pointed out in her talk too, needs to be underpinned by uh, sound analytical science. Um, we need to know what effect the changes that we have, even though they may be slight to the process, have on the actual uh, um, product itself. Uh, we need to maintain those critical quality attributes and also uh, imperative that we maintain the biological performance. Okay, so that was a quick run through from CPI. So I think I've come to the end of the talk. So if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. This is a similar question to one that Claire had. Are there formulations which are more challenging or indeed don't scale up? There are certainly some processes which are more challenging. Um, I think the, the ones that you would think would be more straightforward are those that self-assemble. Uh, and particularly if you have multiple ingredients, well, as, as you go up in complexity, if you're looking at self-assemble systems, then you've got to be sure that they assemble in the right way. So they can be tricky and the more components that you need to add, then um, the more complex the, the, that process is. Um, I tend to find that in our experience, um, ones processes that we've had uh, transferred into us that contain some nasty solvents, for example, they can be quite difficult to, uh, to scale up. Um, whether that solvent be uh, presenting you with a flammabil flammability issue or whether that solvent presents you with a um, a, a toxic, toxicology issue. So depending on the nature of the solvent, they, they, they can be quite uh, tricky to handle, yeah. And whether that gives you any um, problems further downstream. So for example, if you've got ethanol um, incompat incompatibility with filters, for example. Um, so yeah, it, the more complex the system and the more different solvents and stuff, it can have uh, issues, you know, in all stages of the process. And also you detail the QC, QC that's required throughout the process and even involve physical parameters, um, considering any risk to the loss of biological activity in the scale of the process, how is that assessed? Um, that's typically, sorry, go on, Graham. No, go on, Emily, after you. That's typically done um, out, outside of CPI. Um, so we don't typically do the uh, in vitro or in vivo testing. Um, at CPI, so we would just characterise the physical properties um, and then we would back that up with in vitro testing afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for that. So over to you, Alan. Can you see my screen, Sarah? I can, thank you. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, so just, just by way of introduction, um, I, I, I'm a, I, tra I trained in medicine and uh, biochemistry and as a postgrad as a clinical pharmacologist, but the last 35 years or so, I've, I've worked in the pharma industry. And uh, for the last 15, I've run Boy Consultants, which is a, a consultancy that helps and advises uh, small companies and universities translate their ideas into medicine. And over my career so far, I've been involved in bringing about 15 medicines through the development process uh, to be prescription medicines. I'll also add, given a lot of the work we do fails along the way, I've also got a lot of placebos in the cupboard if anybody wants any. Um, and the first half of my career, uh, working mainly in big pharma, I was developing really new chemical entities, so not, not complex medicines at all. But the latter half, most of my work has now migrated really to developing uh, complex medicines. So the biologicals, the, the, the sort of things that Emily and the team's been talking about with uh, nanoparticles, cell and gene therapy, and also perhaps the most complex things you can do, medicines, uh, med medic medicines and, and drug device combinations as well. And, and what I want to talk 
talk about now is, is a general approach to development. I mean, I've only got uh, sort of under 15 minutes, a uh, process that takes sometimes 10 or 11 years to get through. Um, and so the general approach to, uh, to development are, you know, does that differ when we've got a complex medicine and, and what issues might arrive? And then I'll, I'll touch on the regulations. Um, now, um, thinking about it, any medicine we need to, to develop, um, the, the, the governments everywhere and the regulatory authorities ask us to do four things. The first thing is that to get a medicine approved, we have to be able to manufacture it to the right quality and that there is a consistent quality. So this batch is like the last batch is like going to be the next batch and in the required quantities to satisfy uh, the patient demands. We also have to make sure it's safe and tolerable um, and is well tolerated in, in the patients being treated. And that, of course, will depend upon um, the, uh, the indication we're treating. And I'll talk about that in a second a bit more. And then the other thing then, does it work actually? Is it efficacious? And it is it, is it bringing beneficial therapeutic effects to the patient? And then finally, putting all that together, is the benefit risk uh, associated with the product? Is it appropriate for the disease that we're, treat we're treating? So for instance, with if you're treating somebody with end-stage pancreatic cancer, that patient will put up um, and tolerate a lot more adverse effects, for instance, than say developing a new treatment for toothache in a, in a toddler. So you can see that's the difference. But no matter what the product is, doesn't matter what, what kind of product is, the regulators always ask us to do these four things. Can we make it? Is it safe? Does it work? And is the benefit risk appropriate for the population you're treating? And it's no different for complex medicines. Now, what about how do we get going? Now, developing medicines is actually no different to developing, say, a new car or a fridge or whatever, because what, uh, what you have to do is think about the end game. What's the product are you going to produce in the end that's going to treat a particular disease? So is there a need and how are we going to do that? So where we start, uh, and, and a clearly development, as I'll show you, is quite a complicated process, putting together all that manufacturing, the toxicology work, and then the clinical studies, and making sure you're, you know, you're, you're working with the regulations. Um, but we, we think about you know, what, what's the product going to look like in the end? And uh, this is a process we call by drafting a target product profile. Um, and drafting that, that target product profile is absolutely vital. So let me give you an example today. If we're developing a new antihypertensive, now if you look at the antihypertensives that are available and used by patients, um, they're all given once a day and they're very safe. They have a very good tolerability and safety profile because most people, I take antihypertensives, last thing I could do with is lots of adverse effects, you know, because of, you know, I want to work. So that's what we go for. So if you're developing in your antihypertensive, you have to meet that basic criteria. So you can think about that and, and use that uh, um, uh, early on in, in, in in, in your development. So to have a once a day treatment, you want to have a nice long half-life. So in the early work that you do, say the preclinical work, if you give the drug, say to, say to a rat, and it's got a half-life of say 30 minutes, you know it's not going to make it. So you can then go back to the drawing board and think about what you've got. So it's very important then we, we have this target product profile. And we use that then to help steer the development plans. As you'll see on this slide, we, it'll work its way through into what we do from a regulatory perspective, and eventually to the draft prescribing information for the patient, which will then get approved. And likewise, we can also use that to you know, guide us with the publications and, and generate then eventually educational materials for healthcare professionals to use, all with the patient in mind. So when it comes to development plans, we're driven by this, you know, this target product profile and the draft prescribing information. So what is it going to look like? 
Um, and your, your development plan, depending upon the type of company you are, it, you can put that together and take you up, for instance, just to the end of phase two, which is what a lot of small biotech companies do because they know they're going to license it out. Or you can put the plans all the way through to uh, market approval applications in the NDA if you're going to be working in the States. And that depends upon the needs for the business. But the process is still the same. Um, and you need to bring together as part of that development process, as I've, as I've outlined, the key things the regulators want is the manufacturing and chemistry, the preclinical work and kinetic data, if you can generate that, and the animal toxicology results. You also need to know as part of that development plan uh, what data is needed and when it's needed at the various phases of the clinical development. So you don't have to work everything out uh, right from the beginning and you can do it in stages. On the next slide, I've got the Alan Boyd Guide to Drug Development. And you can see here at the left end, this is where we're at the research stage where the important thing about generating the target product profile. We clearly have to get, get the product patented. And that's, that's very important because without that, you're not gonna have protection uh, years, years on. And you work then with the research team um, to, uh, to make sure they are you know, putting together and developing those that compound or those molecules to go through. The next stage is deciding if you're going to actually develop the product. And, and so it's things like, actually, can you translate that, the, the small amount of drug that may have been available and made at the bench, can you scale that up into a large manufacturing process and develop this as we've just been talking about? And actually, initially, is it safe? It will have been given to a few animals, have been tested in vitro and in vivo, and it's, it's shown, A, it's probably going to work in the indication we're looking for, but also, is it safe? And we then put all that information together um, um, with... De detailing with the manufacturer and the, and the toxicology and the preclinical work and, and design a clinical program. And usually it's the first in human study we go to put all that together and send it into the regulatory authorities and, and uh, hopefully get that, that first phase one study uh, approved. And gradually we build on that. This, so the phase one study really is, is the product safe? And that's where we're, we're talking about. And that can either be in patients or in, in volunteers. Next stage is we start to treat patients with the disease to see if we're seeing any efficacious at all, any uh, effectiveness and continue with the safety profile. And then the large phase three studies where we actually confirm the safety safety and efficacy, put it all together and hopefully get approval. Um, now, so with what we're doing with complex medicines, um, as I say, the process is exactly the same all the way through. And we don't, uh, you know, we, we have a set way of working. However, um, you can then adapt that process uh, and, you know, work with the regulators to, uh, to combine certain things because we don't do everything all the time for every product. It depends upon the product and the route of administration. So for instance, if we're in oncology or we're developing treatments for life-threatening indications and rare diseases, more often than not, we'll go straight to patients. So we don't have to go through volunteers and we combine this into what we'd call a phase one, two study and then move into phase three. And many of these complex medicines that we're, we're now dealing with, actually, this is what we're doing more often than not. Most of my work, we're going straight to patients to see, uh, to, to make sure it's worse. So that has the advantage of not only demonstrating safety, but you also get an early readout on the, on the efficacy as well. Now, what about the, the issues with complex medicines? Now, I've seen a big change in recent years. When I was developing new chemical entities, usually in taking, getting closer to market approval and submissions, the big roadblock was always waiting for the phase three clinical results. The manufacturing and chemistry had been sorted out years ago. But over the last 20 years, I've noticed that's changed. With more complex medicines, uh, the rate limiting step is now the manufacturing. And, you know, I've, I've worked on seven out of the 10 um, uh, advanced therapies, the cell and gene therapies that have been approved. And in each one, it's always been the manufacturing. Um, and so because of that, there are, there are things you can think about that you know if you're developing a complex medicine, you need to, to be aware of. 
and make sure really and try and predict that. And a good example is, you know, with a cell and gene therapist, we always have trouble developing the right potency assay. We've got host cell protein, host cell DNA, problems with absorption onto plastics when it's being given and all these sorts of issues. Now, when you're developing complex medicines, you need to expect these sort of problems coming along. Um, and so predict what's going to happen and as they've occurred with other products and try and prepare these for these events with various scenarios and some scenario planning. So anticipate that things will go wrong. There will be issues along the way. Now, what about the regulatory guidance? Well, you do need to develop a regulatory strategy. You can't do anything without uh, advice from the regulators. And if you're dealing with a, you know, with a complex medicine, that's even more important. So my advice to you is to seek regulatory advice as soon as possible, as early as possible in the development program. You probably have not got many results. You might have the, you should probably got the in vitro and in vivo evidence that the drug's going to work in the indication that's come to, that you're going to be working with, but that's about it. But you go to them with plans around how you're going to manufacture the product. What's your tox program going to look like? What's your first in human study going to look? And talk to them about that. And, uh, you know, talk to, you know, in Europe, um, because the European Medicines Agency doesn't actually approve clinical trials, then you need to go and talk to some of the national agencies, you know, like we've got with the MHRA or the French authorities, the NSM, whichever ones, you know, usually we go to wherever you're going to start your first in human studies. And of course, you know, with America being the US, the largest market, it's also advisable to go and talk to the FGA early as well. So do that. Also, um, with many of the complex medicines, I say we're treating rare diseases. So you should take advantage of those special provisions like orphan status if you're dealing with a rare disease, SME status, so you get advantage about the investments and, uh, and, and the support there, and other things like early access to medicines. And the other thing is, as well as talking to them, use the regulatory guidance documents. There's sort of screenshots there. The European Medicines Agency has a lot of guidance, as does the FDA. So in summary, it's a quick run through. I think, as I said, it takes about 10 years. I've talked for just over 10 minutes. So that's a year, a minute for every year. Um, but I think the thing to remember is, um, you know, it, you, no matter what you're developing, you have to be able to make it properly and consistently. It has to be safe in the population. It has to work and the benefit risk has to be appropriate. So it doesn't matter what it is. And as I pointed out, you can um, you know, take some shortcuts with these depending upon what you're working with. So I know that's been a quick run through, but if uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, there's my contact details if, uh, if needed. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alan. That's wonderful. Um, so a couple of questions on here. So one of the things on one of your earlier slides, you had um, providing information for healthcare professionals. Yeah. So if you're an SME bringing forward a complex medicine, how how well versed are the healthcare professionals with the the large variety of complex medicines and the variety of handling and use of them, how much information will they need and how much support will they need? Oh, uh, let me take gene therapy as an example, having you know, developed the first one and took the first one to registration. Um, what you need to do is uh, clearly go and, and talk about uh, the, the medicines that you're developing, like gene therapies at, at various conferences, right from, you know, when you're developing it. Because, um, you know, it, it, at that time, 20 years ago, nobody knew about gene therapies and the fact that biological requirements, because they are genetically modified organisms. And, um, you know, we've seen, for instance, that one of the problems is they've, they've got to be frozen and things like that, you know, down. So you need to think about the equipment that's going in, but also educate them, uh, try and educate them at an early stage about what's coming. And so talk about it at conferences um, and, and take them through um, uh, around with that. And then as you get closer to market, you have to think about how, how they're going to use these products. So again, it's more education. And certainly when you get these, these products approved, you have to put training programs. The regulators want you to put training programs for the doctors going to be using it. 
as well. So it, it's a slow process. So it's a drip feed. You start off with what you're doing and gradually build up publications and go to larger conferences and, and, and do that. Does that help? Fantastic. So also the other thing was, you, you know, you urge and we hear this very often, seek advice from the regulators. Yeah. The cost to that. Yeah. Um, the um, the the cost. Well, each each most uh, uh, it surprises you. The FTA is free. Okay, um, you don't have to pay for for them. They're not a fee for item service. But the bill when you put in your your application for approval is several millions. So they cover the cost in the end when you want when you want to get the drug register. All all the European authorities they they do a fee for item service. So for instance, if you want to go and have scientific advice with the European Medicines Agency, the fee for that is about ninety thousand euros. And, and, you know, you get a couple of hours meeting. OK, you know, it's, it's not long, but it's the process. However, I touched on things like if you've got SME status, uh, small to medium sized enterprise, if you're an orphan drug, uh, if you've got that designation, that fee gets reduced by about 90 percent. But it's still X, you know, you still there's still those costs. And then there's the cost if you're using, you know, external consultants, then, you know, you need to, you need to pay their fees. And typically a, a, a scientific advice for, you know, for say for my consultancy will be about 20, 25,000 pounds because you've got to put all the information together and the questions and prepare and things. So that's what that is. So that's roughly the cost uh, for that. So that was a very detailed answer. And I think that would be very useful to people <laughs> listening. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity now to thank Claire and Emily and Graham and Alan for the talks for today. Um, and I'm just going to share my now as well and remind um, all our listeners today that we also need to thank all of the speakers um, from throughout the series who've given their expertise on their time. Um, and if I can wait my slides up again. Uh, again. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone, as I have done throughout the series, that the slide sets and recordings for all of the series are available on the MDC website. And now that we've had all of the talks, we will be writing this up as we did last year. So it will be a written guide to the discovery of complex medicines as a resource for all of you that are embarking on projects to develop complex medicines. As I say, this will be available as soon as we can get it written and produced. Also, keep your eyes open for our latest State of the Discovery Nation, um, which summarises the current state of research in complex medicines and how the UK can be, become the epicentre. I'm hoping that this is going to be launched um, later this month. And of course, if you have any questions at all, or you need expertise or resource that is featured in this webinar series, please contact us um, and you can contact us through our website there. So until next year, thanks to you all for listening and bye-bye.